Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 12, Austria. So we go to Austria, our first EU member state, where the people don't want to be called German, skiing resorts, yodeling, people who don't want to be called German, pretty castles, and no, people who are very insistent that they aren't German. Austria is located in Central Europe, with it being surrounded by quite a few countries. Italy and Slovenia are south of it, Hungary and Slovakia are east of it, the Czech Republic is north of it, Germany is northwest, and to the west is Switzerland, along with the tiny country of Liechtenstein. Perhaps in a trend for countries starting with A, it is mountainous. The Alps mountain range makes up much of the western and central parts of the country. In the eastern parts of the country, or in the capital city of Vienna, it starts to become more flat, with it still retaining a relatively cold, temperate climate. Austria, like Australia, is a federation made up of nine states. Each of these nine states tends to have a slightly different culture, along with their own government and governor, known as the Landeshauptmann. Now, talking about Austrians ethnically is kind of complicated. Austrians are very closely related to ethnic Germans. So close, in fact, it can seem kind of silly to say that there even is a difference between them. Both speak German, although Austrians apparently have a very rural accent. Both geographically are close together. Historically, they have been very closely linked and have the same ancestors. However, most Austrians don't want to be German, as you will find out. For the most part, Austria is made up of Austrians. However, there are plenty of minority groups inside the country. They can be divided up into two separate groups, old minorities and new minorities. The old minorities make up less than 1% of the population. They are primarily made up of ethnic minorities who have existed in Austria for hundreds of years, and are often found in some of the border regions of the country. Slovenes are often found in the state of Carinthia, while Croats and Hungarians are found in the state of Burgenland. The new minorities, on the other hand, make up 10% of the population. They have come to Austria, in large numbers at least, in the past 40 years, usually looking for a better life or escaping political or ethnic tension at home. They tend to come from either former Yugoslavia, so countries like Serbia or Bosnia, Romania, or Turkey. They can usually be found in urban areas, and especially in Vienna. Language-wise, most Austrians speak German, with 90% having it as their first language. Although it should be noted, Austrians speak with an accent that is closely related to the dialect spoken in the neighboring German state of Bavaria. In the state of Vorarlberg, they speak a different dialect, known as Almanaic. Officially, German is the recognized language, giving it a special status, although Hungarian and Croat in Burgenland and Slovene and Corinthian are officially recognized as minority languages, which does give them certain legal protections. Besides these languages, Turkish and Serbian are both spoken as the first language by 2% of the population, and around 71% can speak English as the second or third language. Religion-wise, most Austrians are Catholic, as it played an important role in the country's history. However, in recent years, the number of Catholics have dropped, with only 57% being Catholic. Most former Catholics become irreligious, with over 20% of the population falling into this category. Other religious groups include Eastern Orthodox Christians, who usually are made up of new immigrants from Eastern Europe, and make up 9% of the population. Muslims who are also made up of new immigrants, primarily from Turkey, Bosnia, and Albania, make up 8% of the population. And finally, Protestant Christians, who historically were found in some of the rural countryside in eastern Austria, make up 3% of the population. Austria was settled along with much of Europe after the Ice Age, with various people groups coming into the country. One of these would be the Celts, who founded the Kingdom of Norcium around the 400s BCE. The Kingdom of Norcium was noted for being an important iron-making location in Europe, and Rome, needing swords for its many conquests and fights against barbarians, decided to absorb the kingdom into the Roman Empire, where it would remain for several centuries. The area would experience mass migration at the end of Roman times by a variety of Germanic tribes. These tribes were being pushed west by a combination of Hunnic and Slavic expansion into their territory, and many would settle in parts of the former Roman Empire, dramatically changing the culture and the language in the areas they settled. Many of the modern-day Austrians are descendants of these Germanic invaders, particularly those from the ancient Bavarians and Alamanni, during the early medieval ages, Austria was very much tied to the politics of Germany and the emerging Holy Roman Empire. Now I'll probably talk more about the HRE in the Germany and France video, but I suppose I should explain a bit about it right now. The Holy Roman Empire is one of those things in history that everyone seems to love to hate. It had an emperor, but besides some of the first few emperors and the occasional strong-willed ruler, imperial power was severely restrained. Local lords and dukes often found themselves having far more control over the affairs of the country than the imperial emperor. Local lords who theoretically were in the same empire would fight not just each other, but also even the imperial crown if they wanted to. The imperial crown also wasn't actually tied to a noble house, like most of Europe's kingdoms and territories were. 
Instead, the emperor was elected by a series of dukes and electors, meaning which dukes and lords remained powerful could change dramatically. So note that the Holy Roman Empire at this time really is a disjointed mess made up of mostly Germans. So what is Austria's role in this empire? While well, Austria really could have been considered the borderlands of German territory, the Germans living there had a fed of attacks from Avars, Slavs, and Hungarians. The Hungarians in particular proved to be a difficult foe for the Germans. However, the Hungarians would be crushed in the Battle of Lexfeld, and it was decided that out of the Duchy of Bavaria that currently held the territory, a new march, or borderland, would be established within the duchy. Thus, in 972, the Margravate of Austria was formed, and thus the first Austrian state. The first Margrave of Austria, Burkhard would rule for a short four years before he was replaced by the Holy Roman Emperor. The new replacement would be Leopold the Illustrious. Leopold would usher in a new area of Austria under the noble house of Babenberg. Leopold and his successors would help establish Austria as an important march and help expand his territory from just around the city of Melk into most of modern day Lower and Upper Austria. The Babenbergs would grow in power, so much so that by 1156, the Margravate would be upgraded into a duchy, thus giving the Babenbergs even greater power. They had gained more land in Austria and Slovenia through conquest and marriage. The capital of the duchy would also be moved to Vienna at this time. One Austrian duke would even go on crusade, with Duke Leopold V apparently getting drenched in so much blood during a battle that when he was removing his belt after the battle, it left a white blotch between two red blotches, which is where the Austrian flag allegedly originates from. However, the Badenbergs couldn't last forever. When Frederick II died in 1246 fighting the Hungarians, he left no male heirs to inherit his duchy. This along with the fact that the HRE's imperial power was incredibly weak at this time, created a power vacuum in Austria. It would be Ottokar II, King of Bohemia, or pretty much the Czechs, who would invade Austria in 1250, becoming Duke. Ottokar would fight off Hungarian claims for Austria, defeating them in 1260. In 1273, imperial power would be given to Rudolf of Habsburg. Rudolf would challenge Ottokar for the title of Duke, and in 1278, killed the Czech king at the battle on the march field. This would bring the Habsburgs to power in Austria, and would result in them practically dominating Central Europe for the next 600 years. The Habsburgs were famous for their political skills. In a short period of time, they moved Austria from just a borderland at the edge of German-controlled Europe to a political powerhouse with several of their line becoming Holy Roman Emperors, and began the process of marrying into several influential royal families throughout Europe. Austria's borders began to expand, and Vienna became an important cultural hub throughout Europe. Austria would still have to fight Hungarians and other German kingdoms, but found itself becoming stronger and stronger. By 1453, Austria had been elevated again to the Archduchy of Austria, making it officially one of the most important players in the Holy Roman Empire. Austria starting in 1438 essentially became the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire, with every emperor being of Habsburg descent with the exception of two, until his downfall in the early 1800s. The Holy Roman Emperors would hold practically no political power by this point, but it's still important to note. Austria would, in 1492, marry into the noble house of Vlaas Burgundy, which gave the Austrians control over the lowland countries of the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. By 1519, the Habsburgs had married into the Spanish monarchy, which led the Archduke Charles V to hold at one point Austria along with not just Spain, but also Sardinia, Sicily, southern Italy, and the emerging Spanish Empire in both the Americas and the Philippines. But Austria's expansion didn't just stop there. In 1526, after the Hungarian king was killed in battle with the Ottomans, Hungarian territory was split between the Ottomans and the Austrians, giving the Austrians control over large parts of modern-day Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Romania. I say all this to really drive home how the Habsburgs had for a time a multi-continent spanning empire. Admittedly, the empire would be divided in the late 1500s, as one branch of the Habsburgs took control over Spain, southern Italy, and the lowlands, while the others took Austria and its central European territories, but it doesn't change the fact that the Austrians really dominated European politics at this time. I should also mention one of the most famous aspects about the Habsburgs, inbreeding. The Habsburgs became so good at marrying into families that pretty soon most of Europe's royalty was related to them in one way or another. Marrying a commoner was pretty gross in the eyes of most nobles at this time, so obviously they decided that marrying their cousin was far more high class. Well soon the Habsburgs had been doing so much inbreeding and cousin f hugging that a metal condition was named for them, the Habsburg jaw. It should be noted that inbreeding got far worse on the Spanish side, but still, the Austrian side of the Habsburgs was pretty inbred. Austria, however, wasn't able to sit back as it quickly found enemies all around it. While in 1526, they had taken a large part of Central Europe, they had also taken the role of being the front line in the war against the Ottomans. The Ottomans had been pushing into Europe since the 14th century, and by the mid-1500s held control of the Balkans and had plans to expand even deeper into Europe. The Austrians both feared that the Ottomans would force Islam on much of Europe, 
along with fearing a loss of territory. This would lead to a series of conflicts between the Austrians and Ottomans, starting with a war in 1527 over Hungary, and ending 200 years later in a war in 1791. Both sides would go back and forth with victories, defeats, massacres, and routs on each side. Perhaps one of the most famous battles of these wars occurred in 1683, when the Ottomans attempted to take Vienna, resulting in an almost two-month-long siege before the Ottomans were driven off by a famous Polish cavalry charge. Ultimately, these wars between the Austrians and Ottomans would result in the Ottomans being unable to push into Central Europe, and also resulted in the Habsburgs gaining more territories in Eastern Europe. I should note a very mean event during these wars. In 1788, in the midst of an Austrian advance into Romania, the head of the Austrian army decided to stop in the town of Kresetis, and decided to have a few drinks. When another group of Austrians joined them and demanded some alcohol, a fight broke out. When the rest of the Austrian army heard shots ring out, they figured the Turks must have been occupying the town and went into battle. What ensued was apparently a bloodbath, as 10,000 Austrian troops were slaughtered, fighting each other, mistaking each other for the enemy. The events of the story are debated, and some historians will say the battle was all made up, but for the sake of a good story, I like to pretend it's 100% true. But the Austrians didn't just have to deal with Muslim invaders. Starting in the 1500s, the Catholic Church would have to deal with the schism within their church, as Protestant churches and ministers challenged the doctrine and structure of the Catholic Church. It quickly took on a political dimension, as Catholics sought to reduce the power of Protestant princes and kingdoms. It all boiled to a head in 1619, with a Thirty Years' War. The Habsburgs, devout Catholics, would try with the help of other German Catholic princes in Spain to crush the Protestant German princes and the emerging Dutch. The war would see many twists and turns, with new players stepping in and out and shifting alliances all around. While at first it looked set that the Austrians would continue to dominate Europe, by the end of the war the Protestant princes, with assistance from the Swedes, and surprisingly, the Catholic French, had exhausted the Austrians, forcing them to sue for peace. The French joined the war in an effort to weaken the Habsburg dominance over Europe, and after the war, the Habsburgs never really were the same. While they still remained important players, and would be involved in conflicts with France for much of the early modern period, they could no longer call themselves the predominant head of Europe. Another effect the war had on Austria was the change of the demographics of Austrian-controlled land. Before the war, Protestantism was a sizable minority, but after, Protestantism had been dramatically reduced throughout the Habsburgs' land. Austrians saw their Catholic fate as an important and integral part of their identity, and helped distinguish them from the other German states in the HRE. While there are German Catholics and Austrian Protestants, Austria began to have an overwhelming number of Catholics. Austria found itself gaining the beginnings of an identity. Perhaps one of the most famous of Austrian's rulers during this time was Maria Theresa. When their father died in 1740, Maria Theresa inherited his lands, which resulted in the War of Austrian Secession, as France, Prussia, Spain, and Bavaria all sought to weaken Austria, using Maria Theresa's gender to try and challenge her claims to the rule. However, Maria Theresa would emerge from the war as the recognized heir to the Austrian domain. Although her husband would technically be the one in charge, Maria Theresa was acknowledged by most to be the actual head of the country, leading the country into a series of reforms. She modernized the army, creating the first standing Austrian army, increased government regulation into the economy, and created compulsory schooling for those in Austria. She also more controversially argued against religious pluralism, and hoped to eliminate both Protestantism and Judaism from Austria, and establish greater state control over the Eastern Orthodox in Austria, along with the press and newspapers. Maria Theresa's reforms and leadership ultimately allowed Austria to survive into the 18th century, and her military reforms would especially help Austria in the coming years. However, Austria still showed signs of weakness. While Maria Theresa had ended the War of Austrian Secession as the ruler of Austria, it had lost the region of Silesia to Prussia. This would be the start of a rivalry between the two states, and both found themselves slowly starting to compete for influence in Germany and on the world stage. Austria and Europe itself found itself having to deal with new Enlightenment ideals that argued for individual freedom, property rights, and reason. This stood opposed to the Austrians, who feared the traditionalism of the Catholic Church and the Habsburgs, who ruled in an almost unchecked monarchy. By the end of the 18th century, many Austrian nobles and the Habsburgs themselves were fairly confident that these Enlightenment ideals were nothing but a bunch of drivel, that they could hopefully ignore it, and surely wouldn't result in a bloody continent-changing revolution in France. In 1795, a bloody continent-changing revolution happened in France. The French Revolution scared the hell out of almost all of Europe's ruling monarchs. They decided to form a grand coalition of European states to defeat the French, the Austrians would join this coalition and form the War of the First Coalition. The name of the war might hint at the fact that this coalition didn't defeat the French, and there would be another six coalition wars to try and defeat France, who by the Second Coalition War had come to be led by the general, Napoleon Bonaparte. Bonaparte, being the military genius he is, defeated the Austrians throughout Italy, driving them from most of their Italian holdings, and then the Third Coalition War had been the Austrians so bad 
that the Holy Roman Empire itself was dissolved. Austria emerged from the war, now as the Austrian Empire, still under the Habsburgs, but finding itself weak. Austria fought and lost the Fifth Coalition War, losing much of their territories along the Adriatic coast, and a part of eastern Austria, and resulted in Napoleon marrying into the Habsburgs, a move that on paper seemed like it would end the Austrians' desire to fight the French. However, after Napoleon's disastrous failure to capture Russia, Austria, along with much of Europe, decided to turn on the French, and finally defeated them. A final Seventh War would occur in 1915, but that too would result in French defeat. The end of the Napoleonic Wars would result in Austria finding itself in a very different Europe. Austrians had lost more than 750,000 men during the fighting, and had lost their title of Holy Roman Emperors. While Austria still was a great power, the 19th century would prove very unkind to the Austrians. The 19th century saw the rise of nationalism, and the idea of a nation-state, or a state where everyone is of the same ethnic group. For the Austrians, this was a problem. Remember, Austria had held control of Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia since 1526, and expanded into Eastern Europe and the Balkans throughout the centuries. Austria wasn't just a nation of Austrians, who, by the way, still are considered Germans by most people, but also a huge number of Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, Romanians, Ukrainians, Serbians, Slovenes, and Italians. These people, who had for a very long time had to live under Austrian rule, found themselves increasingly demanding greater say over their own affairs, and slowly at first began to demand to become independent. But even many German Austrians began to find themselves unhappy. Austria had a very conservative government coming into the 19th century, and the emperor, by 1848, Ferdinand I, had a policy style of micromanaging just about every single detail of his empire. While managing such a large empire as the Austrian Empire certainly would be a difficult task, the task wasn't made any easier by the fact that Ferdinand suffered from seizures and epileptic fits, which forced him to rely on his very conservative advisors. A growing college-educated liberal opposition emerged who wanted civil service reform and greater rights for the middle class, along with a new growing set of radicals who embraced quasi-socialist ideals and wanted to overthrow traditional social structures. In 1848, revolution would come across Europe, and the Austrians were hit hard. Liberals and radicals would riot in the streets of Vienna, with liberals arguing for a political revolution, while radicals argued for a social one. Its Italian territories were threatened by Italian nationalists who wanted to create a whole Italian state. Its German neighbors suffered under similar revolutions, as Germany argued for a united Germany. Minority groups throughout the Austrian Empire argued for greater rights, and Hungary even attempted to break off from Austria. The revolutions of 1848 would force Ferdinand to abdicate the throne, allowing his nephew, Franz Joseph, to take the throne, a throne which he will be on for a while. Austria would be forced to create a constitution, granting limited social rights, and did give some rights to minority groups. However, Austria still remained a conservative country, with many conservative political institutions and social structures in place. The Austrian military also beat back the Italians in the first war of Italian independence and crushed the rebellious Hungarians. But the revolutions of 1848 changed the course of Austrian history. While United Germany wasn't created, Pan-Germanism reigned supreme throughout the German states, and even to a certain extent in Austria itself, which the Prussians decided to utilize to their full advantage. There was two visions of a united Germany. One would be the Prussian view, that united Germany should include all and only German majority lands. The other, the Austrian view, argued that united Germany should include all German majority lands along with the entire Austrian Empire, which, as I mentioned earlier, was composed of a lot of different people. The Austrian view was popular for German and Austrian Catholics, who feared rule under a Prussian-slash-Protestant dominated Germany. Both Austria and Prussia would jostle for power over Germany, but in the Austro-Prussian War of 1866, Austria was decisively defeated, and in 1871, a united Prussia-led Germany would be created without the Austrians. But Prussia wasn't the only problem for the empire. In the meantime, the Italian nationalists had fought and won the Second and Third Wars of Italian independence, forcing the Austrians out of the region of Veneto. Nationalism among the minorities of the empire also remained, with many starting to argue that many of their lives would be better under their own independent nation-states, and not under Austrian rule. In 1867, Austria would give a huge degree of autonomy to Hungary, technically making Hungary sovereign from Austria, although Franz Joseph would sit on the throne of both Austria and Hungary, and controlled Hungarian foreign policy. The Austro-Hungarian Empire would find itself dragging behind many of its contemporaries in Europe, losing its status as a great power. The only good things Austria had going for it coming into the 20th century was its annexation of Bosnia from the Ottomans, and some killer music being written in Vienna. As many of you probably know, World War I was started due to the assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914 by Serbian nationalists. Franz Joseph, by this point, had lost his brother to a revolutionary firing squad in Mexico, 
his son to suicide, his wife to assassination by anarchist, and now his nephew. He was, to put it lightly, kinda bummed out. Austria gave Serbia a list of demands they had to obey in order to prevent war. However, most of these demands were impossible to carry out for the Serbian government, and war was declared in 1914. Austria, with the assistance of its former enemies, Germany and the Ottoman Empire, fought against the Allied powers of Russia, France, Serbia, Montenegro, and the UK. Austrian involvement in the war would begin with the Austrian advance into Serbia and Montenegro. The Austrians would fail to take the two Allied states for a while due to fierce Serbian resistance, mountainous terrain, and incompetency on the Austrian high command. This upset defeat, however, wouldn't save Serbia, as by 1915, Bulgaria and Germany had aided the Austrians with troops of their own, and with overwhelming numbers had taken the countries. Austria would continue to fight in the Balkans for the rest of the war, primarily against Serbian insurgents and allied forces that had landed in Greece and pushed into Macedonia. Austria would also send troops east to fight the Russians. The Russians would take parts of Austrian-held Galicia and Poland at the start of the war, but as the war continued on, the Russians gradually began to lose ground. The Austrians were threatened with an attempted Romanian invasion into Transylvania, but by late 1917, Russia and Romania were defeated, and both forced out of the war. However, this wasn't easy for the Austrians, as hundreds of thousands of men would die on the Eastern Front, from not just gunfire, poisonous gas, or artillery, but also brutally cold winters and disease. By 1915, Italy would invade Austrian Tyrol. This came as a bit of a surprise for the Austrians, as Italy had actually promised to side with them in a war against France. But Italy still wanting Italian majority lands under Austrian rule instead joined the Allies to try and take these lands. The Italian advance failed, and brutal trench warfare began. The Italian theater of the war is famous for not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, not nine, not ten, not eleven, but twelve battles over the Isonzo River, most of which resulted in little gains for either side and a lot of dead soldiers and displaced civilians. Other theaters the Austrians would participate in would include the Western Front and the Palestinian Front, sending limited troops there to try and aid their allies. But the number of dead would pile up. By war's end, 1.2 million Austro-Hungarian soldiers would be killed, not to mention civilian deaths from enemy occupation, famine, or even imperial crackdowns on regions deemed to be dissident, or supporting the enemy. The death of Franz Joseph in 1916 really was a death nail for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was just about the only thing keeping the empire together, and without him, people split. By late 1918, the war was to all but the most die-hard supporters of the Central Powers, certain to end in an Allied victory, and with that, the empire broke apart. Poles and Ukrainians had separated into new states created by instability in Russia. Romania had taken Transylvania. Hungary broke off, hoping to escape the wrath of the Allies. Czechoslovakia was declared independent, taking with it a large number of Austrians who lived in the western part of the country. Italy had taken South Tyrol and a part of Slovenia and Croatia, while the rest of Croatia and Slovenia, along with Bosnia and Banat, joined the new state of Yugoslavia. Austrians were distraught. Around 3 million German Austrians found themselves outside the borders of New Austria. It had lost well over three-fourths of its empire, and even what remained was contested. The Austrian state of Voyabeg voted to join Switzerland, although the Swiss rejected it. Yugoslav forces took parts of Carinthia, and Burgenland, while well, given to Austria by Hungary, had a large Hungarian population who fought to remain with the country. The Treaty of San Germain in 1919, signed by Austria and the Allies, was incredibly harsh, forcing the Austrians to reduce its army, pay off war debts to the Allies, give up a lot of its infrastructure, give up its submarines, which wasn't too bad for Austria considering it's now landlocked, and was prohibited from joining Germany. Austria merged as the first Austrian Republic, with actually a lot of the same political structures as it has today, such as a bicameral parliament, a chancellor who acts essentially as a prime minister, federalism, and a weak president. Austria's economy was fairly weak, and similar to Germany next to it, entered a period of great political turmoil with three main groups vying for power. First of these groups was the Christian Social Party, or CS. This party represented Catholic conservatives and primarily operated in the countryside. It was a strongly nationalistic party, arguing for an Austrian identity and saw the Austrians as Catholic Germans who managed to turn their rural country into one of the most powerful in Europe. It argued for the Catholic Church to have a dominant role in the nation's politics, favored authoritarian ideas on governance, and supported a more corporatist economy, which means labor unions are highly organized and work in direct communication with the government and industry to advance the interest of the nation. The CS would be the dominant party throughout the First Republic, holding the chancellor position almost the entire time. The second group is the Social Democratic Party of Austria, or SPO. The SPO sought to represent urban workers and socialists, 
and found themselves dominant in Vienna. The SPO was mostly made up of social democrats and democratic socialists, but also found itself home to radical revolutionary socialists and communists, who all had positive feelings towards the Soviet Union and hated the democracy they found themselves in, which they saw as being dominated by reactionary elements of Austrian society. The SPO would remain the second largest party during this period. Finally, the last group are the Pan-Germanists, who were represented by the Greater German People's Party and the Landbund. Both parties were popular with Protestants and in some of the most rural areas of Western Austria. They opposed the very idea of an Austrian state, dominated by Catholics, and sought to merge Germany with Austria. They also supported national liberal ideas, such as free trade, a sense of community for all German-speaking people, and a desire for limited government interference in the economy. All three of these groups, as you might have guessed, stood opposed to each other. They had close to no respect for each other, and quickly, political violence would start up in Austria. Street fights and assassinations became common throughout the country, and as Austria didn't have a large enough army to stop the violence, the job was left mostly to paramilitaries that were directly tied with the three main political groups to try and maintain order. As the Great Depression tanked Austria's already weak economy, radicalism on all sides flared up more and more. Soon, the Pan-Germanists found themselves holding positive views towards the new Nazi regime in Germany, and quietly, Germany began to fund Austrian Nazis. In 1933, the CS Chancellor of Austria, Engelbert Dollfuss, would suspend Parliament and started cracking down on any left-wing forces in the country. The CS would dissolve, and what took its place was the Fatherland Front, an Austro-Fascist party. It became the dominant party of the new federal state of Austria, with it organizing Austria into a corporate estate, arguing for Catholic social teachings in society, and holding friendly relations with fascist Italy. In 1934, the SPO, along with the Communist Party of Austria, attempted to take back the country and establish a socialist state. However, after only four days of fighting, the SPO and the Communists were crushed, with both parties finding themselves banned, with its members either fleeing to Germany, going underground, or shot by government forces or fascist paramilitaries. Dolphus further establishes rule by banning any parties or organizations that were controlled by him and his new authoritarian regime. Now you may be thinking that the Fatherland Front and the Nazis might get along. After all, both are far right, opposed to the left, and dislike democracy. But you have to remember that both had a radically different view of what Austria should be. Austro-fascists wanted a Catholic Austria free from German influence, who they saw as being dominated by Protestants, while the Nazis, who were mostly Protestant, wanted Austria to join Germany in order to form a greater German state. In 1934, the Nazis attempted a coup, killing Dolphus, but failed to take the country, as the country failed to rise up against the Fatherland Front, and Italy threatened war with Germany should they intervene. But Austria was weak without Dolphus, and by 1938, with Nazis infiltrating the highest levels of Austrian government, the Austro-Fascist regime fell. After Hitler threatened to invade the country, a totally not-rigged election took place, where Austrians overwhelmingly voted to join Germany with Anschluss, or joining occurring, and Austria becoming a part of the Third Reich. Austria found itself quickly thrust into the Second World War, with almost a million Austrians joining the German war effort. Austrians also worked in factories creating machinery for the war, and worked in Nazi concentration camps. Before annexation into Germany, around 9% of Austria was Jewish, while by war's end, less than 1% was Jewish. Most Jews either fled the country to Israel or America, or were killed in concentration camps. Some Austrians would attempt to resist Nazi occupation, but it remained small throughout the entire war. After the war, Austria, like Germany, was occupied by the Allies, and divided between French, American, British, and Russian zones. However, unlike the Germans, Austria wasn't considered to be at fault for the war, with it being considered the first victim of the Nazis. The occupation of the country ended in 1955, with a new Austrian Republic being formed. Austria would be a democracy with a lot of the same rules as the First Republic, but also being a strictly neutral country, siding with neither the West nor the East in the Cold War. The three main political camps emerged after the war, with similar bases and ideologies as before, but much more moderate. They also found themselves working with each other more, as they recognized their inability to work together drove the country apart, with most Austrian governments post-war being coalition governments of two or more parties working together. The SPO emerged with the same party name and leadership, although it became a more definitive social democratic and center-left party. The conservatives created the Austrian People's Party, or OVP. The OVP abandoned much of its Austrian nationalist rhetoric for a Christian democratic one, arguing for strong Catholic ideals but still backing liberal democracy and a more social market or mixed economy. The Pan-Germanists first created the Federation of Independence before creating the Freedom Party of Austria, or FPO. The FPO no longer argued for joining Germany, but did still argue for a German identity to the country, and also found itself pushing semi-libertarian economic ideas. 
Now, Austrian history after the war enters a more mellow period as political violence is dramatically reduced, and Austria found itself trying to keep a more neutral position in the Cold War. Austria became a social market economy and industrialized. By the 70s, social liberal policies were enacted, giving women and minorities greater rights, and slowly, the process of immigration into Austria from Turkey and other non-European nations began, as people left these countries to find work. The end of the Cold War began a transition in Austrian politics. In 1994, Austria joined the European Union, with it growing closer to many of the states around it, states that historically had had bad blood towards Austria, but now most of these grievances seem to be in the past. It also has seen much larger rates of immigration, particularly from Eastern Europe as communism collapsed and the Balkan War devastated much of former Yugoslavia. The SPO became a pro-EU party. The LVP also became a pro-EU party, along with shifting a bit more towards the right and courting interest in joining NATO. The most radical change would come from the FPO, however. The FPO in the 80s began to abandon many of its pan-Germanist and liberal ideas. Instead, it came to embrace right-wing populism and argued for a reduction of immigration into Austria, opposition to the European Union, and supported nationalist ideas on the country. Along with changes within the three main parties, more parties began to make themselves known, with the environmentalist Greens probably being the most influential, along with other parties such as the Liberal Forum, Alliance for the Future of Austria, and NEOS. Austria today remains one of the most developed countries in the world, with some of the highest living standards. In terms of problems the country is facing, it remains fairly limited compared to other states I've covered like Afghanistan or Nagorno-Karabakh. However, it does find itself at a point in history where there's a lot going on. Austria's economy is closely linked with the EU, so any instability there could result in damage to the Austrian economy. Austria also has a rather high ecological footprint compared to the rest of the world. The South Tyrol region of Italy, which is mostly made up of German speakers, has an independence movement that wants to rejoin Austria that creates a little bit of tension. Immigration into Austria also has created some tension, as anti-immigrant groups argue immigrants don't integrate into the country, while pro-immigrant groups argue that these anti-immigrant groups often are Islamophobic or racist, and these immigrants fill labor shortages in the country. Regardless of all of this, Austria today remains probably one of the most stable countries in the world. The current president of Austria is Alexander van der Bellen. He was elected president in 2016, becoming the first green president of the country. Van der Bellen is considered a fairly centrist president, arguing for increased ties with the EU and supports broadly social liberal policies. The chancellor and real head of the country is Sebastian Kurz. Kurz, a member of the OVP, is noted for being both one of the youngest leaders in the world and also for pushing the OVP into a more right direction, arguing for reduced immigration, opposing same-sex marriage, and wanting to reduce taxes. He was first elected chancellor after the 2017 election, going into government with support of the FPO. However, after a scandal in 2019, where the FPO's leader bragged about political corruption within the party, Kurz broke off relations with them. In the 2019 election, the OVP again came out victorious, this time forming a coalition with the Greens, a good example of how in Austria, parties that are generally fairly different can and will still work together. So why does Austria exist? Austria is a country that, at the start, I joked about really did not want to be called Germany. Austrians today have a strong sense of national identity, seeing themselves as different from Germans, via their Catholic and largely rural identity and relation with the Habsburgs. Austria was able to thrive in a relatively complicated part of Europe, and even though it entered periods of struggle and stagnation in its history, it found within itself the ability to emerge strong, and even at one point, was the dominant power in Europe and arguably the entire world. We certainly haven't seen the last of the Austrians. Next time, we will go east to Azerbaijan, prepare for fighting with Armenia, friendship with Iran and Turkey, and our final A country, Everybody, give a round of applause. We're almost done with the A countries. Anyways, thank you for listening. Uh, you may have noticed that I didn't come out with this on Friday. I just kind of released it when I was done with it. So I might start doing that. Thank you for listening. If you want to email me, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for if you want to send your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Thank you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Also, I want to shout out to Podcast, uh, Anthology of Heroes and Founders of Nations. I've talked about them before on the channel. Uh, they both released episodes on Algeria earlier this week, I think. Anthology of Heroes released an episode on Massinissus, the first king of Numidia. And Founders of Nations released an epi two episodes, actually, um, on the Algerian War of Independence. I know I talked about both of those in my Algeria episode, but I really kind of scrimmed over them. Uh, I'm trying to talk about so many things in these episodes that it's hard to just, you know, really get down to the details. And these, these, these two, they really went into the details, so... Check them out if you want to listen to them. I'll put a link in the description. 
The sources I use for this episode are All That's Interesting article on the Battle of Kranzebez, Austria's info page on the history of Austria, Danzing HD Mappers video, The History of Austria Every Year, French 24's report, Austria Sebastian Kurz, The Whiz Kids Posed to Make History, Geography Now's video, Austria, History Matters video, The Austria-Hungarian Empire, Jazby's video, The Austrian Civil War, Joe Scott's video, The Most Inbred People in History, Kings and Generals documentary, Siege of Vienna 1529, Kings and Things, Knowledge PD's video, Why Isn't Austria a Part of Germany, M. Laser's videos, The Final Days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Dissolution of Austria-Hungary, Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History of Austria, Rock Burtwed's page, The History of the Social Democrats, The Revolution's podcast by Mike Duncan, seasons 3 and 7, The Armchair Historian's video, How Did the Ottomans Lose the Siege of Vienna, The Great Wars video, Austria During World War I, Franz Joseph in World War I, and worse than Versailles, The Treaty of San Germain. Time Goes History's video, Not All Fascists Are Nazis, Civil War in Austria, and Appeasement, How the West Helped Germany, and finally, Wikipedia.